Hello, Jackie. Hi, Annika. Thank you for being here. Thank it's you an for honor me. for us to have well, you in it's our an honor show. For me. Thank you. When was the first time that you realized that stories can have power? Oh, I've been doing them for so long. Um, it's, it's not a straight line. You do stories, and to me, they're like putting a little pebble in a pond, and you never know when the wave is going to wash up on a beach. But I was lucky early in my career to do stories that, they weren't all happy stories, but stories that made a difference. I remember very, very early in my career, my first job, I wrote a story about a judge, a very prominent judge in the town I was working in. And um, I wrote a story that got him in trouble because he had a bad drinking problem. Yeah. And um, several people came and tried to pressure me. He had been arrested uh, by the police for um, inattentive driving and they found a lot of cough syrup in his car. And he was drunk, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote about it and a lot of pressure not to. But eventually what happened is the judge's family did an intervention and sent him to treatment and he got better. Um, and so little things like that would happen. Um, and there's a story after story after story like that that you just realize you don't know what kind of impact it's going to have. But if you do it with genuine care and um, people pay attention, sometimes it has results you just can't predict. What is the power of the story? How do you measure the power of a story? Well, in this day and age, Annika, a lot of people want to measure it through analytics. They want to be able to count clicks and count how many people look at your site. I never did that. For me, it was more whether you would get letters back from the readers, whether you would get calls from the readers, um, whether maybe a law would change, or you would influence how a discussion was played out in government over an issue. Um, one of the ways I always measure whether a story works is whether the people who read it start telling more stories. So if I write a story about someone and then somebody else tells their story about a similar situation and then that person tells a story and another person tells a story, pretty soon you have this cascading, um, this cascading kind of river of stories where everybody's realizing they have a lot in common. And to me that's the most powerful measure is when, when a story gets another story going. How do you usually, or did you usually pick stories? I mean, does yeah. it have to be something very spectacular, uh, no. fantastic happening, or, or a common situation, but you knew that there was something about it? Well, I covered a lot of very traditional news for a long time, and I worked for, on purpose, I worked for smaller newspapers for a long time. I never went off to New York or Washington. I could have, I just never did that. I liked writing for people I knew and knew about and understood. Um, and so I had to do a lot of real straightforward news and a lot of it wasn't a big deal. But I think if there was a thread, I was always more interested in the people who were either making the decisions or were affected by the decisions or were wrestling with decisions than I was about the process itself. And if you look carefully and just watch people involved, you'll find a good story. Because um, everybody has something going on in their lives Let's say it's a, let's say it's, it's a uh, city council person who's trying to decide about whether or not to vote for money for parks or money for police. Well, they've got to make a tough decision there, right? Who, who gets to win and who gets to lose in that decision? And how do, they make, how do they make a values judgment? And who are they thinking about when they make it? And so if you start looking at that, you'll usually find a good story. Some stories are obvious. You know, they're people who are in great conflict, uh, people in war zones, people facing a big tragedy, people who have horrible things happen to them and they have to figure out how to wrestle with them. But a lot of really good stories are just people who are sort of getting through their life every day like all of us are. How did you find your story that uh, came out as the AIDS in the heart Yeah, I had been covering issues connected to the, to the gay rights movement in the United States for two or three years. And I just happened to be doing that. It was part of another beat. I was covering minority affairs. Um, and I included um, the gay community as a minority because they were a political and a social minority. And nobody else was covering them. So one of the things that you do, right, is if nobody else is doing it, you have, I'll do that. Um, you have free running room. So I was covering the gay community in the gay rights battle, which was mostly a social, moral, political, legal battle. And then AIDS shows up. And we start noticing this trajectory of terrible, terrible illnesses among 
mostly among young gay men. And so I just happened to be in the middle of it when that blew up. And so we started to switch our coverage, not exclusively, but AIDS was such an influencer of how people saw the gay rights movement in the 80s in the United States. And the two of them became really connected in people's minds. So it changed the debate for both good and bad. And so at some point, and it was when the actor Rock Hudson died, um, he was a big major Hollywood actor, romantic lead, gorgeous man. When he died, uh, it was reported that he died of AIDS and that he had been in a long time homosexual relationship. And it made everybody go, how is that possible that Rock Hudson is gay? Because it defied how people thought of yes. gay men. So it sort of opened a window of opportunity for us, and I had a very, very forward-thinking editor, and she just said, I want to get ahead of this story, not behind it. Journalists are pretty bad at being ahead of social movements. We're always kind of trying to figure out where it's gone instead of being ahead of where it's you know, going to go. So she just said, go find this story out and write it every way you can. And so one of the stories that we considered, which fit into the kind of work I most like to do, was what we call a walk-in-your-shoes story. So we wanted to find someone who was dealing with AIDS and, and share their life and walk in their shoes through the process of facing that death and facing the discrimination that came with the illness. It took us almost a year to find, after that, to find the two men who became the subject of our story. How much time did you spend with these two men? You know, Annika, that's a good question, because um, both the photographer, Jean Pierre, and I were doing other things while we were doing this coverage, but I would say from the time we met them until the time we wrote the last story about them was probably 14 months, maybe, no, maybe even more, maybe 18 months, because we first met them like in November of 1986, and I think I wrote the last story about them in May of 1988. So there's a span there of about 18 months. The primary time we spent with them, that compressed time, was over the course of about six months. It's a very personal and yeah. very human yeah. approach of yeah. this uh, story. Yeah. Uh, did you know at that time that uh, you would probably have a great success with it? If you mean did I know I'd win a Pulitzer, no, you never <laughs> know that. No, 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 no. Um, no, I just knew the story mattered and I couldn't let go of it and both the photographer and I were deeply invested in it and we just sort of lived it. Um, it's really rare and special when people will give you access like that to their lives and you, you have access to all of it and they're going through a crucible moment in their lives that represents yeah. what other people are going through. That's really special. And Jean and I had done enough work, we were still fairly young, but we had done enough work like that up until now to know that what we were in the middle of was pretty rare. And you won the Pulitzer yeah. with, the, with the series. Uh, how did it affect you, this mm. prize, you know? Did it change you, your career, I suppose? A lot of people, especially back then, um, considered the Pulitzer a, a, a ticket to do anything you wanted in your career. Um, I didn't find it that way. Uh, in part, I was at a smaller newspaper. I wasn't at the New York Times or the Washington Post. I was at a smaller city newspaper. Um, I had a story that was very, very unconventional. and People were very nervous about it. Um, they didn't quite know what to make of it. And I got a few offers, but I had also decided that I wasn't going to go anywhere because the paper that had allowed me to do this story had been very loyal to me, and so I was going to be loyal to them. So I made a conscious decision I wasn't going to go anywhere for a couple of years. So, and I had other stories. I was already on to doing other things. I mean, I think the week, the week that the Pulitzers were announced, I was finishing up the last of the stories in the series, and then I got on a plane and flew to Greenland to cover a dog sled expedition. So I wasn't spending a lot of time thinking about it. Um, it does change things. I wouldn't be here, <laughs> frankly. It opens doors. Um, your name is out there. Um, it got to the point where I did get a lot of job offers, and I had decisions to make. Um, it changes a little bit the dynamic in your newsroom because people, you put expectations on yourself, you're supposed to do that level of work all the time, which is not possible. 
other people either get jealous of you or expect you to be doing that kind of work. But on the whole, I think mostly it just, for me, opened a lot of doors. It gives you a level of confidence that says, you can do this work, and if you rise to the occasion, you can do it well. Um, but mostly it means your name is out there, and you have that credential that if you want to call somebody up and say, I'd like to work with you, they go, oh. They Google you, and they see that, and they say, oh, I guess, I guess you're serious. Yeah, I'm sure it means a lot. But uh, this, uh, the AIDS in the heartland, wasn't the most important story for you as a person, you once said. It depends on how you define importance, right? Um, uh, yeah. The first story I ever did that showed me that, um, that helped me understand what my particular voice and style was about uh, was a story I did when I was maybe 30. Um, and it was just a story in which a photographer and I followed a graduating class through their last year of high school. We just wrote about 18-year-olds graduating from high school. Um, and it was, it was so interesting and so, um, so unexpected what we found and how people reacted to that story. And it was one of those stories where we wrote about these kids who were at a certain point in their life, you know, that, that rite of passage. And all the calls we'd get with other people telling us the stories of when they were in high school. Oh, I remember the girl who, and I remember the guy who was always the bully, and I remember the fat girl who no one would date. And so that was a really interesting thing. I think in terms of my career trajectory and what I really wanted to do, the most important story was probably when I went to Africa in 1985. Um, and covered the famine. And again, it was Jean, the same photographer I worked with on the AIDS story. And we went to Sudan, and we were covering all of the refugee camps from the people in Ethiopia and Eritrea and Oromo who were coming over the border because of the famine and the war. And so it was the first time I had been out of the country. Um, all of the big stations and all of the big papers were covering it, so we were there with serious, serious journalists. We were in way over our heads. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, and so we took our own approach to the story, and we ended up being a finalist for the Pulitzer for that piece, and it was an international story. And that story is also the story that showed me that instead of staying on a traditional track, covering government, covering courts, I wanted to go out and cover humanity. This is what you once said, that the North Star for you in journalism yeah. is yeah. Uh, the center of humanity. Yes. I don't know, some of it, I suppose, is just how you're wired. Some of it may be, um, you know, I, who knows what happens in childhood. The kind of books I read. Uh, I was the only girl in a family of four boys, so maybe I was a little lonely. Um, um, I find human beings, um, if you get into their humanity, I find that, that we have more in common. That if you cover government, it's often about conflict. Um, it's often less genuine. You're covering a lot of spin, if that translates. You're covering a lot of people who are on either side and want to argue without kind of saying, but here's how we live every day. So several years ago, I came to the conclusion that traditional news has always been defined by what's happened. Here's, the, here's what happened yesterday. The prime minister said this, or the courts ruled that, or the police shot a guy in the street. Or this report came out. And I think, I think news is what's happening. And what's happening is what happens to us every day. Are we going to get into college? Are we going to get a better job? Are we going to find a way for our child to be happy? Um, are we going to buy a new car or not? Those are the kind of decisions everybody has to make every day. And it tells us that we have more in common. And I, I kind of like searching for not the conflict, but the commonality in the middle of the conflict. With this so much compassion or stories that you're working hard on uh -huh. and it affects you and uh, is it possible to get tired? Oh yeah, yeah I think my, my editor once found me. I was supposed to go cover a funeral for a family. Uh, it was a very wealthy prominent family, business family in, Minnesota, in St. Paul where I was working in Minnesota and lovely people, very good family and uh, husband, wife, five children and the father was a small airplane pilot and they had a tradition of every year he would fly the family to Colorado for a ski vacation in thanks at Thanksgiving, the American Thanksgiving. And one year when he was flying back, he ran into a storm and the plane flew into a mountain. 
and he and his wife and four of the children were killed. The oldest son, who was 17, hadn't gone on the trip. He had stayed home for the first time because he had a girlfriend and a job. And I ended up covering that story. And I remember the day I was supposed to go to the funeral, my editor found me hiding under my desk, weeping, saying, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. So he said, well, just go, and you don't have to write a story. Just go and be there and see what happens and see who's there. Well, I get there, and who stands up to give the eulogy for the family but the 17-year-old boy? Oh, God. And he was so um, brave and so composed, and he so wanted to honor his family that he stood up and gave the eulogy. So I went up to him after the service, and I said, I'm not here to interview. I just want to tell you um, how sorry we are for your loss and uh, how much we admire you and how much we admire your father. We've heard mon many, many things about what a good citizen he was and how important to the community. And I said, but I don't want to bother you. And the kid looks at me and he says, I'd love to talk to you about my family. Mm -hmm. So I end up in his house and have to like listen to his stories about his family. But um, it's interesting how much people want to listen if you give them, a, or how much people want to talk if you give them a chance once in a while. But yeah, you get tired. Um, but then you have a place to, to take that exhaustion. You put it into a story so you're not holding it in entirely. Um, you feel the, the gift that somebody gives you by spending that time and sharing their story. So I think you can get tired in the moment, but over the long haul, I, for me at least, it hasn't. It's been nothing but a good thing. I, I don't feel depressed by it. I don't feel like it's drained me, or you know, it's it's. I don't feel it's taken a big emotional toll. If anything, I think it's made me better, um, happier, stronger. And stories have a life after being printed and read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't that a isn't that a hard thing to come terms with? Because we go into people's lives, we put this story out there, then we do go away, um, and often the story doesn't get followed up. And I've, al I've always been curious about how that story changes people's lives. And some of the people I've written about I know because I keep in touch with them, but a lot of them you just never know what happened and whether that story was a positive force in their life or whether it caused problems for them. If I had one um, sort of big thing I could do, if somebody gave me enough money so I could just go off and do this. I would love to f travel around the world, United States, but then the other places I reported, and find the people I wrote about 20 and 25 mm -hmm. and 30 years ago who were in really difficult or really challenging or really um, intense situations, and I'd love to know what happened to them. Why don't you do this? I don't have enough money. <laughs> it, it, you know? We you know, should make some calls. <laughs> I know, we should make some calls, yeah. yeah. Okay. But wouldn't that be interesting, you know, to find the refugee you met in, the, 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 the Kurdish refugee that you met in the refugee camp in Turkey after the first Persian Gulf War, you know, after the United States invaded Iraq the first yeah. time. To go back and find out what happened to that family once we got back into that war now, and Iraq is still in the news, and the Kurds are now back in the news, when I was in Kurdistan after the per first Persian Gulf War, we went back into Iraq. We hitchhiked into Iraq before the um, before the military got there, and we were in the we went into the cities that the UN peacekeeping forces were trying to take back from Saddam's army. And I was in a hospital one day that was just being taken over by Canadian doctors. Otherwise, it was just a pit. And I met a young woman in there. There was only one room in the hospital that was clean. The other hospital were dead bodies and, and mattresses everywhere. It was just awful. And there were hundreds of people outside waiting to see the doctor. And there was one room in the hospital and it had about 20 people in it. People with cholera and people with typhus and people who were terribly sick. And there was a 17-year-old girl in that hospital room who had just given birth to a baby. And she tried to give me the child because she had no money, she didn't have any hope, she didn't know what was gonna to happen to her country, her community, her family, she was in terrible pain, she was all alone. She tries to give me this baby. Well, I can't take her child, that's just completely wrong. But I keep wondering what happened to that baby and mm. what happened to that young woman. What an interesting thing to figure that out. That would be a story. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe someday.
this is a the digital age. Yeah. The age we are running and everything is so fast, as you said. Did storytelling change? Um, good question. Journalism has certainly changed. Um, journalism has gotten, I think right now, I'm hoping we get through this, but journalism is now much more a combination of professionals like, um, like you and me, but also non-professionals who have access to a voice now that they didn't, who can join in the conversation. Um, all you have to do is look at the Arab Spring or any of the things happening out there and the people with their mobile phones and Twitter, they're part of, they're part of journalism now. That's a huge change. So it's no longer a one way, we're telling you what happened. We go out, find it out, and then we tell you. It's now like a constant three, four way conversation. So that's a change. The speed of it has changed. There's not as much ability, and I think this is an unfortunate thing usually, there's not a much, as much ability to, to go out and cover something and then to find out all the other perspectives and think very carefully about what is the, as close to the truth as you can get. So right now, immediate facts tend to trump a truth that's got a little more insight and perspective. So that's a change. The core of stories themselves has, hasn't changed. Um, if you look at what still makes a story that people respond to, it's all still the same thing. It's just how it's getting distributed and how people respond to it is different. I don't know, to be honest, if I would have done AIDS in the Heartland as comfortably today as I would have back then because I would have had to accept the fact that the responses online to the story from the public would probably be pretty harsh and pretty mean and pretty discouraging. And that these two men would have been subjecting themselves to a lot of really, really nasty commentary from people who had access to that forum mm. and didn't have to be responsible for naming themselves when they said terrible things. And that, that causes me pause. Of what, are we, what are we throwing people into these days? Not because I think we're trying to do anything wrong or even anything um, ambitious, but because I, I, we see it in the United States all the time with issues of race, issues of immigration, um, issues of political ideology. If you write a certain kind of story, the online commentary pretty soon gets pretty ugly. Yeah. And that's very discouraging. You're a professor today. You teach yes. young people. What do you want to teach them in the first place? Ooh, that's a good question. I want to teach them craft, the, the core components of what makes good journalism. Mostly I want to help them decide if they really want to do this and if they want to do it for the right reasons because it's not an easy thing to do. And because of the economic contraction of the news economy and the news industry, they're going to have to really want to do it more than ever because there's no clear path anymore for how they're going to get paid, for what kind of jobs they're going to have. They're going to have to find their own way. I don't know if it translates, but they're going to have to kind of bushwhack through the, you know, through the forest um, and find their path, which means they have to really know that deep inside of them, there's a part of them that wants to do this. Um, so I want, to, I want to help them figure that out. I can't teach them that, but I can help them figure that out. I want to help them get a hold of the foundational principles that make for good journalism. So when they go out into that wilderness, they have a really solid core that can't get pushed aside by people who would want them to do less quality or less ethical journalism. And then I want them to, um, to have a really good grounding in the core parts of the craft. How do, you, how do you approach a source and reach agreement with them that's responsible about what your relationship's going to be? Um, and you're transparent about that with them and the public. How do you gain access to situations that you need to see? How do you interview and listen to a story subject in a way where you really think you're hearing them completely as opposed to hearing what you want to hear or hearing what you presumed you were going to hear? How do you then take that information and fact check it so you can make as sure as you can that you're getting most things right? And then how do you shape that into a story, whether it's for print or for broadcast or whether it's for a photo essay or a video that 
gets to the heart of the story and will keep people engaged and, and have some insight. That's what I want to teach them. Or more, probably more accurately, that's what I want them to learn. Uh, what do you think about the young generation of the journalists? You know, my, my students are fantastic, but we're lucky at Missouri. We have students who come from all over the world, and they come there because they want to study journalism. Not all of them, when they get there, not all of them end up wanting to study it. They realize that they had one idea about it, and it's something else, and they just go, well, this isn't me. But um, I, I talk to other people like me who came out of the profession and are teaching now at other schools, and they sometimes have students who are just not as engaged. Our students are our, our students are usually there. Some of them are frustrating. Um, they always, you know, there's a lot of talk in the United States about this generation of, of young people having an air of entitlement. They think the world's going to be handed to them. They have all these expectations. They don't want to work as hard. They don't want to pay their dues. I don't find that so much with, with my students. I saw that five, six years ago. I think that we've gone through that, and these students are very realistic about what they're up against and what it's going to take. They work hard. If anything, they work too hard. A lot of my students were a public university. A lot of them are working two and three jobs to get through school. Plus, they're taking on thousands of dollars in debt, and they keep doing it. So you're here in Cluj and mm -hmm. in Romania because uh, you came to this conference, The Power of Storytelling. Right. My and fourth time, my fourth, fourth time. conference, right? Fifth time in fifth time in Romania and the fourth okay. conference in a row. Yeah. So you must consider this conference quite important. Yeah, it's become kind of my home conference. Um, uh, I used to do a lot of this back in the States. Um, it's part of what I do is, you know, I, I, I go to workshops and I'm on the, you know, what we call the circuit. I, there's this group of us who sort of enjoy and apparently have some ability to go speak to other people. And so I was doing a lot of this already. And then again, because the news economy changed so much in the States, a lot of those conferences went away. I'm not just saying this because I'm here. This is, this has become one of the best narrative and storytelling conferences in the world right now. Um, Boston University is having a reprise of a storytelling conference they do, and it's very, very good, but for a while it was, it didn't exist. Um, I've, been to, I've been to conferences like this in Paris, and in Leipzig, and in Amsterdam, and in Copenhagen. This one's better than all of them. Oh, so nice it's to hear this. And it's true. I mean, part of it is because of the energy of the young people who put it on and their passion. Um, Part of it is because the openness of people here who are hungry for this sort of yeah. thing, and, op and they're very warm. You know, if they don't sit in the audience like, rah, 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 what do you know? <laughs> what are your plans for the next few years? Oh, that, oh, that's, oh, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. Um, I just sat with my financial advisor to figure out if I could ever retire. Because uh -huh. those of us who went through the housing collapse and the journalism collapse in the United States kind of lost a lot of money. <laughs> and I never made, a, made that much in the first place. Um, I'm trying to figure out how much longer I want to work. I'm trying to figure out if I want to continue working primarily at the university and do other things like this, or if I want to move away from the university and have the opportunity to do more of things like this, and then maybe write a book on interviewing, write a book on, on the writing craft, maybe find a way to pursue that story to go and find the people who I'd like to catch up with. Um, so I'm at that age where it's kind of one big question mark. Um, not a crisis, but I'm not quite sure. I'm lucky I have options, um, and they're all good. But uh, it's hard to think after, I've been working full time since I was 11. And it's, you know, I've been working full time for 50 years. It's hard to think about not working all the time. And mm -hmm. to think about what would I do. And I love my garden, but can I really garden all the time? I don't think so. It's a small garden. <laughs> I wish you can accomplish what you want thank to do. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's been great fun.